This is a story of how humanity escaped the bonds of gravity and took ever more dangerous steps into the pursuit of flight, freedom and understanding the unknowable. Many of you will have heard of the Montgolfier brothers' hot air balloon that allowed Jean-Francois Pilatre de Rosier to become the first person to achieve flight in 1783 over Paris. Everyone will know of the Wright brothers' historic 1903 flight near Kitty Hawk in North Carolina that began the age of powered human flight. But while this will be peppered with familiar names such as NASA, Lindbergh, Armstrong, this is about the 20,000 universities and companies and the 400,000 nameless people who took mankind from dreaming of flight in Paris to the sea of tranquility on the moon, built the technology that allowed space telescopes to probe the origins of our universe and maybe, in a little more than 10 years time perhaps, put human footsteps on Mars. This is not just a look at the famous and celebrated, but also those hobbyists who devoted their lives and the unsung engineers who toiled behind the scenes. Because despite the US Army purchasing a Wright Brothers aircraft in 1909 and the Royal Italian Army using an aircraft for the first reconnaissance and bombing mission in 1911, it wasn't until the need for military aircraft in World War I that professional aviation was born. Until then, it was left to the amateurs, because there were only amateurs and the geography and topography of certain areas were crucial for the early flight craze. Long Island and Kitty Hawk both extended out from the mainland into the Atlantic Ocean, giving excellent windy conditions, and Long Island in particular had the benefit of wealthy enthusiasts in the early days. Josh Stoff, the curator of the Cradle of Aviation Museum in Garden City, New York, explains. Uh, so you're at the Cradle of Aviation Museum, and we're kind of different from just about all the other air and space museums in the country and that we're a local history museum. We don't just collect anything, we try to tell a very specific story about what happened here on Long Island, New York, um, the historic events that happened here, the many companies that developed here, people, who, individuals who contributed to aerospace from here. So it's kind of the whole, it covers the entire 20th century aviation and space flight, but, but just seen through a lens of what, of Long Island, what happened here and the contributions of things from here. Mm -hmm. So we're very, very focused story. <laughs> Am I right in thinking that starts off with the Wright brothers? Uh, no, it actually goes before the Wright brothers. Okay. So our first gallery deals with uh, basically early experiments that led up to power of flight. So we're talking about early experimenters. We have balloons, kites, gliders, and these actually focus on local experimentation. That's a replica of an 1894 Lilienthal glider, and William Randolph Hearst lived on Long Island at the oh, time, right. okay. and he purchased one. So that was the first winged flight, was he had his uh, driver, he lived on the north shore of Long Island on a big bluff overlooking the beach in a Long Island Sound, and he had his driver jump off the cliff, and that was the first <laughs> manned flights on Long Island, 1896, there was a ballooning experiment, you know, a lot of uh, mm -hmm. balloonists uh, here, and there was a transatlantic flight attempt from Long Island, 1873, kite experimentation, so it was a lot of early experimentation, mm -hmm. um, Augustus Herring, who actually built a powered aircraft before the Wright brothers that was not successful, but he was working with powered flight, and he was a local uh, inventor, um, you might have heard of Langley, built an aircraft, he tried to catapult and fly before the Wright brothers, and his pilot and the guy who built his engine was Charles Manley, who was from Long Island here, so going back to the very dawn of flight, um, we touched on the Wright brothers a little, they're not from Long Island, they did fly here later in the 1910 period, 11 period, and then we come into the uh, pioneer era, so this is 1909, 10, 11, when you had really the first airfields, United States were on Long Island. Mineola Flying Field was founded in 1909. It's really the first airport in the United States. Um, we have a, an original Blario, the oldest airplane in the uh, museum collection. And we have that one because uh, the first flying school on Long Island, the Moissant School, founded in 1910, flew, used French Blarios for uh, instruction. And the first uh, licensed American woman aviator, Harriet Quimby, learned to fly in the Blario here on Long Island. Um, replica of the Wright brothers, the Vinfiz, first aircraft to make a transcontinental flight from Long Island to California in 1911. And the first plane to fly successfully on Long Island was the Herring Curtis Golden Flyer in uh, 1909. 
won the Scientific American Trophy for the first flight of 25 kilometers. So a lot of uh, activity. You had the first major air meets in the United States here at Belmont Park in 1910, where the most famous aviators from the world came to Long Island. It was a horse race track then, it still is now, and it attracted huge crowds, setting new speed and altitude records and no other air meets in 1911, 1912. So this long, long island really is a focal point of aviation yeah. going back to the very beginnings of uh, flight. And does it still maintain that kind of mecca-like status? Not anymore. Here? The manufacturing, the, for building complete aircraft, it's gone. Uh, there's a lot of companies building uh, smaller parts. We have an exhibit later on. There's uh, about 250 aerospace companies on Long Island, you know, locally now, but they're all small building electronics and hydraulics and high techy stuff like that. But no more complete aircraft. That industry's gone. Um, there's still a lot of people employed in the aviation industry. The airports are huge. Between Kennedy and LaGuardia, you know, we have yeah. the busiest airports in the world, and that's hundreds of thousands of people on site and off site supporting commercial aviation. So. But the industry's changed a lot. <laughs> this confluence of amateur aviators and engineers would discover new opportunities to build markets for flying machines, agricultural crop dusting, barnstorming, winning prizes for endurance records that laid the foundations for both the agricultural and commercial airline markets that would follow, but which also developed the critical technologies and skills required for military needs and the space age that we take for granted today. And uh, going from uh, the pioneer era, we go into World War One, and uh, where we are now is Mitchell Field. It was founded in 1917 as a primary training field for the Air Service. Mm -hmm. So they used aircraft like this, uh, Curtis Jenny, JN-4, that's an original Jenny. And this one is uh, important not only because it was the type of planes first used here, but this was actually Charles Lindbergh's first aircraft. He bought this in Georgia in 1923, did some barnstorming with it around the South and Midwest. And uh, he, uh, this was actually the first uh, airplane the museum uh, procured, the wreckage of it in the 70s, mid-70s, and before Lindbergh died. He actually came to see it being restored and verified this was his airplane. <laughs> he, was in, he was in some crashes in it. He'll recognize all the scratches. The, well, and, and he carved his initials in one of the wing ribs. <laughs> so, uh, so it's important that, uh, so for two reasons for us. So we go into World War I, and the focal point is what happened on Mitchell Field locally. You had a lot of uh, major uh, training for the air service and the Navy on Long Island. Uh, World War One, and you had the beginning of the aviation industry, really, the first aircraft actually being manufactured here. Odd-looking small plane was called the Grease Penguin. It was a non-flying basic trainer built for the air service in World War One, and this is an original from 1917. There were 300 built as the only surviving example. And this basically was a primary trainer. They would students would get in it and go racing across the airfield and just try to learn how to keep an airplane going in a straight line, yeah. which was hard to do because there were no brakes and no steerable wheels, <laughs> and uh, it was too underpowered and too short wings to get off the ground. They would have the same control as an airplane. And they would just basically learn how to keep it going in a straight line for takeoff and landing. So if you could fly this, you could fly yeah, an actual pretty plane. much. <laughs> and other exhibits on World War One combat training, what happened locally. Uh, here, Navy engine from a seaplane from World War One period. See how uh, how modified they are from automobile engines. Yeah, <laughs> pretty powerful engine in its day yeah. actually. Yeah. And this is kind of a neat exhibit over here. This is an original fuselage of a Thomas Moore Scout from World War One, and we exhibited uh, uncovered so people could see the inside of a World War One fighter parts labeled so you could kind of understand how it all works and how uh, really simple and how exposed the pilot was. And then we use it to uh, show how an interrupter mechanism worked because that's a common uh, question is the machine gun shoots straight ahead, why doesn't it shoot the propeller off? So we created this mechanism uh, showing how that all worked. And that is basically a cam on the back of the engine. It's a rotary engine. The whole engine is spun around and the crankshaft is actually bolted to the plane. They had engines like this in World War I because it was the only way they could actually cool off the engine was to spin the whole engine to get that much airflow over it. Mm -hmm. So the cam in the back has lobes that line up with the propeller blades and there's basically a very simple me mechanism of push rods going back to the machine gun. So that split second when the blade passes in front of the gun barrel, it forces open the breech of the gun so it can't shoot the propeller off. And you can see just what a simple mechanism it was and it actually worked. <laughs> 
So we're going into the gallery that called the Golden Age of Aviation, which is the 1920s and 30s when Long Island was really a, a focal point of aviation. We're on the eastern edge of the United States, the western edge of the Atlantic Ocean. So anybody doing transcontinental flights or transatlantic flight attempts all began or ended from Long Island. So we, a lot of that in this gallery focuses on the great flights, the historic events that happened here, and how the aviation industry locally really mm. took off at that time. This is dealing with historic flights that happened on Long Island, 20s and 30s, R-34 airship. Flew from uh, Scotland to Long Island, first round trip crossing the Atlantic in 1919. And of course we have an original sister ship of the Spirit of St. Louis. Lindbergh took off about a mile from here, made the first non-stop New York to Paris flight. That's an original book by Ryan in 1928. They actually were selling them commercially with extra seats in the front and they had a windshield. Oh, right. So this is one of the only surviving original Ryan Broham's. And this was uh, reworked in 1955, the movie The Spirit of St. Louis with Jimmy Stewart. This was used in the movie and that's when they covered over the windows and everything and made it look back like the spirit. But it's really an original from the same period as uh, Lindbergh. With a groundswell of geographically concentrated aeronautical and ballooning activity, areas like Long Island became not only meccas for amateurs, but drew the interest of large companies that would dominate the aviation industry over the following half century. Many of these were founded in this unique Long Island conurbation of aerial pioneers. Companies such as the manufacturer of the World War II P-40 Warhawk, which was formed after Glenn Curtis had spent three years with Alexander Graham Bell's Aerial Experiment Association, which established the world's first aeronautical research and development organisation, described by Bell as a cooperative scientific association not for gain, but for the love of the art and doing what we can to help one another. This led to Glenn Curtis forming the Curtis Aeroplane Company in New York, Republic, who built the P-47 Thunderbolt and the F-84 Thunderstreak for use in World War II and Korea, made its home among this burgeoning community in Long Island. As did Sikorsky, who built the helicopters that recovered all the Gemini and Apollo astronauts and capsules from the ocean. And Grumman, who built the Apollo lunar modules, also took advantage of the aviation skills and enthusiasm here. We had Grumman being founded, uh, which really continues to this day as Northrop Grumman started off building fabric covered biplanes. And we have a replica we built of Grumman F3F, an original Grumman goose from the late 1930s. We had Curtis here on Long Island, and we have an original Curtis Robin. Uh, Bruno Winkle biplane built locally. And this deals with a number of the local manufacturers Sikorsky, Seversky, Loaning, Fort, you know, all began uh, here on Long Island in the 20s and mm. 30s. Fran was just telling me earlier that um, some of the companies don't realize just how important to enthusiasts a lot of their past documentation yeah, and things are, yeah. and they'll just throw them out rather yeah, I've than I've seen a lot of archives go in the garbage, unfortunately. Oh, it must so, break your heart. Yeah. So this is a kind of a recreation of a late 1930s Long Island waterfront scene, Port Washington on the North Shore of Long Island. That's where the first transatlantic commercial flights took off from land, and that's a photo of Port Washington Harbor with a Pan Am clipper taking off in the uh, harbor. So we have a dock with seaplanes tied up to it. And we're actually adding new exhibits on the uh, left there. We have a fuselage covered up. You can see that we're always adding new exhibits to try to make it a little better all the time. Yeah. But then we're coming from here into World War II when this was uh, aviation industry was a huge employer on Long Island, by far the largest employer. There were several major companies here. Grumman uh, was big and Republic. Uh, and several other smaller companies, Brewster and General Aircraft, building airplanes. We have three original Grumman airplanes from World War II, Wildcat and Hellcat fighters, and an Avenger torpedo bomber. So that was pretty much naval aviation of World War II is really dominated by uh, locally built Grumman aircraft. We exhibited in kind of a recreated aircraft carrier flight deck setting. On this side, we have a P-47 Thunderbolt built by Republic in Farmingdale. And up above it is a uh, Waco CG4 troop glider, and they were also built locally by a couple of firms here. It's kind of an expendable airplane, the kind they would use to you know, land troops behind enemy lines, like on D-Day. And uh, uh, most of the bomb sites used in World War II were built locally, Norden and Sperry bomb sites, Sperry gun turret, and a number of other things. So basically focusing on manufacturing more than operations in World War II. Yeah. Every gallery has an aircraft cockpit people can go in, so they kind of see the aircraft evolution of cockpits at the time, video, World War II action. And now we're going into the post-war period, which we call the jet age. 
It's the beginning of uh, really major uh, commercial transportation after the war. You know, all the airfields began or, or developed on Long Island. LaGuardia got bigger. Kennedy was founded and got huge. So we deal with commercial aviation, the introduction of jet aircraft. And again, local production continues with the public aircraft and Grumman aircraft built in the 1940s through 1960s. From Cougar, we have a uh, Republic Thunder jet next to it and uh, exhibit on Republic. And they, Republic went out of business in the mid 80s. Their last aircraft was uh, the A 10 Thunderbolt, which was still in action to this day. Uh, best close air support aircraft ever built. <laughs> That's the one for blasting tanks, isn't yeah, it? It was designed for tanks, but now it's used to support infantry by, you know, when they come under attack, they have that Gatling gun in the front, yeah. and they just, you know, protect the guys on the ground, really. They don't run into tanks very often, mm. but, uh, so enough exhibits on Grumman through the 1960s, 14, and there's a small exhibit on commercial aviation uh, today local airports, air traffic control. Try to keep this up to date on the airliners because we, uh, people out here see air traffic every day with all the airports yeah. here. So just try to, people can identify, you know, what's what, just through all the current type of airliners that you see yeah. overhead here. And then uh, another small exhibit on local manufacturing showing what some of the samples of some of the things that these local companies are building on Long Island today. A lot of electronics, hydraulics, you name it, so <laughs> still a pretty healthy industry, but it's changed. Yeah, what, what was the um, what was the driver? Was it commercial and economic for Grumman and oh, others yeah. to, to well, move out of the area? Well, Republic was always a one contract company, and when they uh, after the A10, they started building a trainer called the T46, and the Air Force canceled that program, and that was the end of the company. With Grumman, they merged with Northrop, and all the manufacturing is so much cheaper to do someplace else, so yeah. they moved all the manufacturing down south. Mm. And, and but it is still great to see that there yeah. is still, still so much <laughs> related to the airline quite industry. A, quite a few, yeah. yeah, and the airline industry is huge. And then we go into uh, space, and again, the chronology starts again, going back to the beginning of rocketry and space flight. We have a number of missiles and rockets suspended, and all these are local products from the 40s and 50s mainly. And uh, the yellow one in front you might recognize, it looks like the German uh, V1 buzz bomb, and that's actually built by Republic in 1945. Oh, right, so it's that's a... It's a, uh, it's a reverse engineered copy. The, yeah. um, there was obviously some land that didn't explode in, uh, in England, mm -hmm. so they, the army gave one to Republic, and they wanted hundreds of these built, and they were going to use them for the invasion of Japan, launching them off ships and planes to overwhelm the Japanese air defenses with flying bombs. Mm. So Republic actually built this called the JB-2 Loon, and they built them for both the army and navy uh, in 1945. And of course, with the atomic bombing, they never did the invasion of Japan, yeah. so it wasn't used. No. Um, and the father of rocketry on Long Island known as Robert, well, nationally, uh, Robert Goddard. He was funded by a Long Islander, Harry Guggenheim. He came here to get his funding to build, build the first, uh, world's first liquid fuel rockets. So again, it's a local connection to the history of uh, I didn't realize that was here either. It was here. Well, they weren't launching it from here, but this is where he came to get yeah. his money. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just uh, getting the space program, uh, space race. Sputnik uh, obviously kicked off the space flight yep. race and with small exhibits on early projects, Mercury, Gemini, and then uh, Apollo and Grumman, the most historic thing built on Long Island. Obviously, in 1962, Grumman gets a contract to build the lunar module for Project Apollo. So we have the best collection of uh, lunar modules really uh, in the world, and since it's so important to us. I'll take a quick walk through here, but this is, um, this is a lunar module test article, LTA-1. So we exhibit it without the skin so that people can see the, we just leave it alone, preserve it the way it is. This was the house spacecraft at Grumman that they used. It was the first one they built and they used it for testing, pressure tests, electrical tests, any of the upgrades for later lunar modules they would build on the year first. Mm -hmm. So it was in use throughout the entire Apollo program as a uh, test spacecraft. I think it's really nice and important as well that you recreated this to look like it would tried to with a local the, manufacturer. Uh, a clean room at a setting at Grumman with the white room and scaffolding and mannequins and white working on it show how they were built in a very clean pure environment to try to keep any dirt or debris out of the spacecraft yeah. you see kind of before and you could see what it looked like underneath all the uh, outer skin 
So we have an uh, early uh, uh, Apollo command module that was flown unmanned, uh, just so people could see the uh, spacecraft. Oh, this is not a replica then? It's not a replica, it's a real one. It's mm -hmm. film of it. was used in a launch abort test. Yep. It's a Block 1 command module, so it's the same as the one that was in the fire with Apollo 1. Yeah. The early hatch that was very difficult to uh, open and close. And you get a size of the scale of the parachutes there scale as well. Of the parachutes. So this is so it's a real command module that was flown, but it did not have uh, people on it. But it just looks just like the ones. That yeah. And then this is the original simulator for the lunar module. So this was at Cape Kennedy, and uh, this is what all the astronauts trained in. It originally was in a room that looked like this, and that was in the center there. And it had uh, projectors and big screens behind all the windows, and it had a camera over model the moon, and it would actually simulate it. Is this some of the one of the models? Something like that. Yeah. And uh, so it was no, it was no uh, digital computer representation. Mm. It was actually a camera filming a model as they were coming down to land on the moon. But it's the most complete lunar module interior in the world, really. It's got all the original controls and uh, everything. So, uh, it's, and the, it's uh, the detail is in there is incredible as well. It's, the yeah, fact it's, that for it's, a training, a simulator. You well, they, they try to make it as realistic as yeah. possible. And in fact, there was some astronauts actually slept in this. True, <laughs> in the simulation, they wanted to get the understand how cramped it was and for yeah. sleeping on the moon. I had to hear all the sounds of the vents and the fans going and everything. So actually, astronauts actually slept in this in hammocks. Wow. And uh, so that is the back half. It would have been closed originally. Obviously, we opened it up uh, so the people could see the back and the front. And that cylinder sticking up there, that's actually the ascent stage. That's the top, the ascent stage engine actually protrudes into the cabin. It would have been under that cylinder there. Life support system over there. Storage, wherever they could fit it. The hatch there going up to the command module. And the hatch, the square hatch in the front, which was the egress hatch going down to the uh, moon surface. So, yeah, so there's a photo over there. That's, uh, so that's Neil Armstrong. Mm -hmm. so that's Neil Armstrong standing there. <laughs> the same simulator so that's kind of neat that uh, we have that the thing that never fails to jump out at me is just how nuts and bolts everything is yeah. you think of it well the, the, i mean we've got the phrase space age technology that comes right. from this but everything is nuts and bolts and, and rivets and, and metal. if you look at it there's no computer screens no it's it's, it's the cockpit looks closer to a world war ii airplane than to yeah. a modern airplane because it's just at the very beginning of the computer age there is yeah. a computer keyboard there where they would punch in uh, commands and things, but there's no display screen. Yeah. So they're looking at mechanical type instruments, giving them uh, readings. And uh, yeah, and so the computer was the most advanced in its world at the time, but uh, it was obviously very crude by modern uh, standards. But yeah, it's a very, it's really the simplest way you could probably get to the moon design, yeah. you know, it's just, it's very elegant engineering, as simple as uh, possible. It's almost like someone had been just set a challenge and they got to get, yeah. it, get it done within 10 years or <laughs> that, something. Well, yeah, they didn't even have that, you know, the government got the contract in 62, 62. And, oh, that wow. was, yeah. and that was after Alan Shepard's flight, so we had a total of 15 minutes of space flight experience and then they got a contract to build a spacecraft to land on the moon, you know, yeah. so have one ready in six seven <laughs> years ready to uh, yeah the first uh, one flew in 68 so yeah. six years which is uh, really remarkable yeah, it really is that fast. yeah so then we have a, a replica of a Gemini spacecraft for people that can go in and just because we try to again have a cockpit in every gallery so people can get in something of the yeah. uh, era to see you know, and it's, we simplified the interior on it because if we had as much as a real Gemini, you wouldn't have been able to get in and out. It was so cramped in there, so we simplified it to make it safer. But even with that, you could see how cramped it was and how terrible the visibility was. Yeah. Uh, some interesting things on exhibit here. This is something that's been to the moon on every mission from uh, all of them, so uh, it's some really unique, important artifacts there. That's a, probably the largest piece they removed from the Apollo 13 lunar module before they abandoned it oh, in Earth right. orbit. So Fred Hayes took an armrest off <laughs> and gave it to Grumman. And that's a nameplate that went to the moon on uh, Apollo 11. It's the nameplate for M5, Eagle. So, wow. so yeah, some neat artifacts and bits and pieces of uh, lunar modules, uh, just showing some original parts up close. And then we have uh, a one of a kind models showing the evolution of the design of the spacecraft, including ones that were never oh, built. Oh, look at that. Which really, uh, so the Grumman had a whole architecture because they thought Apollo program was going to keep going into the Apollo applications program with moon bases and everything like that. Yeah. So this is the early evolution of the lunar module and it stopped here. Yeah. So they basically, that was design that went to the moon, but they had further designs they wanted to develop with uh, mobile lunar modules where it would land and drive around, lunar module laboratories and space telescopes in orbit. So 
So these were plans that they had oh, yeah. ready we to have, go if NASA so wanted them. We have a lot of information on that, yeah. a lot of reports, blueprints. Yeah, there was supposed to be a whole continuance of Apollo, not just through Apollo 20, but they, they had a plan actually going through the whole 1970s with mm. developing moon bases and orbiting moon stations and Earth space stations. So, uh, yeah, but that all got uh, canceled in... Uh, through the Vietnam War, basically, because that's where all the money went in uh, 1971. They canceled the whole Apollo applications program. I think that the most impressive one there, perhaps the most difficult to carry out, is the one that's an LM, um, yeah. a lunar module ascent stage uh, uh, as, a, Mo- as a mobile. Mo- Molem, they called it. Molem, mobile <laughs> yeah. um, lunar module. Yeah. Because then you actually had a pressurized laboratory you could drive yeah. around instead of just a little uh, dune buggy thing. Then some other exhibits, uh, local astronauts, so far 13 astronauts have come from Long Island, uh, so we have... Not just from New York, but from Long Island. Just from Long Island. We don't I even thought it was Ohio that, no, that, we don't, that, we that don't was even, supposed to be where no, all the astronauts we don't even came cons- from. If we included all of New York State, it would be a lot more than that. So these are just local uh, people, and some of them are pretty famous uh, yep. shuttle astronauts. Hoot Gibson is certainly one of them. Yep. And there's one astronaut now in the program uh, locally, too, so we got to small things that they wore on and you have some of the latest the the, the, the current the, the group 22 group of yeah. 22 uh, the, uh, there's a yeah local her, uh, yeah, a woman uh, who's actually a pilot in the Marine Corps and uh, she just graduated so maybe she'll go to the moon yeah another uh, maybe to Mars uh, yeah, living in space we have some original Apollo and shuttle era clothing food waste facilities. So, so this is LEM-13 uh, that was designed for, uh, it would have been used probably on the Apollo 19 mission and Apollo's uh, 18, 19, 20 got cancelled so there were a number of leftover spacecraft and this one remained at Grumman and we were fortunate to uh, get it. We refinished it to look like Apollo 11. Uh, it never had the outer uh, foil or thermal uh-huh. blanket put on. Oh my god! <laughs> At this point, I'm just marveling that the Cradle of Aviation Museum not only has a lunar lander and ascent and descent stages used for pre-flight tests and upgrade compliance testing, but also the only unused Apollo lunar lander in existence. All others you see in museums are mock-ups. At the same time kids were getting excited at seeing a lunar lander, I was slowly slipping into a nerd coma, so I'll let Josh continue. So this is a real lunar module, and we got it. It didn't really have the... Uh Outer skin was some stuff that was incorrect that Grumman just put on for a show at one point. So we refinished it accurately to look like the Apollo 11 lunar module. I think it's the most accurate finish of uh, any of them uh, anywhere. It's all the uh, thermal blankets. We got donations from DuPont of all the correct material that was used on the lunar module. And it's all different colors depending on the thickness of it and what it's made out of. We actually had people install a thermal blanket who were originally technicians on Apollo. Wow. And uh, one of them, they re- put it on Apollo 11 then, and then they refinished ours. They did it with the correct tape and staples and did it, the folds and layering exactly the same way. So it's really the most accurate uh, representation. And we, a passion project for each of those oh, people yeah, as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And we, def- we this simulated lunar surface. We put it on as based on photographs of the Apollo 11 landing site. They actually were pitched back like that. And when they hit, they were going sideways. So we have the landing probes on the foot pads. They were all bent up in different directions because they, they were actually drag marks across the moon, moon as they were going sideways uh, when they landed. So I remember just trying to recreate that first uh, step on the moon. So really LEM-9 and this one, LEM-13, are the only ones that were designed to go to the moon and never did. <laughs> yeah, because the one for 19 and 20 aren't yeah. around, are they? Uh, no, 20 is definitely gone. I think there's, um, at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, there's a crappy mock-up of a lunar module sitting behind it. I think half of that is part of the LEM-14, which would have been Apollo 18 and 19. Yeah. So I think that's half underneath the bad skin that was put on it. Yeah, I think the basic structure is half real. So, <laughs> and this one would have been Dick Gordon's. Well, has well, Dick Gordon been over here? Uh, probably uh, Fred Hayes would have been the commander of that. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, he was. He was. He was uh, well, actually, this one was probably going to be uh, 19. Right. And Lem 9 from at, at the uh, in Florida now that was going to get an upgrade and you know an upgrade, and that would have been 18. I have a schedule that shows Lem 13 for Apollo 19. Yeah. So in LEM 9, it upgraded on Apollo 18, and, and uh, Apollo 19 was going to be Fred Hayes, the commander of this one. Yeah, so has he been over here? He has been this? here many times, yeah. yes. Yeah, that must be bittersweet for yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> we have a video running with it. 
which we're really uh, lucky to have made. Uh, when the museum opened, we got Industrial Light and Magic to make it for us. They did these special effects for like Star Wars. So, and they did really the most accurate representation of what the Apollo 11 landing looked like if you were there on the moon watching. So they got the, every thruster firing is just right. The sun's in the right place. So it's really neat to look at the video of what it looked like if you were there to watch it and then see the real one. On the <laughs> that moon. really is spectacular. So, that that is just like a hit, camera on the moon. sideways. Yeah. And then you've recreated right. that exactly here with the recreate aqua, that, yeah. lunar module. So yeah, that was the uh, pallet on the side. The uh, Alsa pallet that lowered down is a handle there hanging down. He would pull the handle as he was coming down the ladder. Mm -hmm. He would lower that down and the camera lens was there sticking out through the thermal blanket that took the video of him stepping off the ladder onto the moon surface. Yeah. And is there any difference? So you, you've recreated this as an Apollo 11 yes. lunar module, but yes. this will have been larger, it, have more greater no, capability, it, greater capacity for uh, later yeah, missions? Yes, but visually it was this, the dimensions and everything were the same. Still the same. But that was all the same. It was. Uh, it would have had a lunar rover on that side, yeah. which we didn't have anyway, and you know a lot of internal changes, upgrades to it that yeah. uh, wouldn't have shown anyway. So, but the external is we finished looked to have like Apollo Eleven. Yeah, I'm just so overwhelmed at the moment. I mean, uh -huh. um, as a, I'm not sure if I mentioned when I when I first came in here, I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of the replicas of it, mm -hmm. but it's the size of it that's really surprised me. And then you go across to right. the mock up, or rather the simulator Clean. over there. Yeah, yeah. And it's the, the it's the it's the converse. It looks tiny. Yeah. It looks like how do you <laughs> actually get room. two well, people? Well, the remarkable there. thing about that simulator is, yeah, it was designed for two people for two or three days, mm. but on Apollo 13, you had three people living in that for a week. Yeah, that really tested it out <laughs> to the max, <laughs> yeah. didn't it? For a week. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. so. And um, are you planning any exhibits for um, Artemis as that starts advancing forward? Uh, in... I'm sure we will. And when you know we're uh, we're building some replicas of current uh, spacecraft, we're building a uh, large scale Dragon model, and we're going to build a Blue okay. Moon lander and that kind of yeah. thing. So we are going to do it. I think this, it's still nebulous, kind of the program where it's going. I mean, yeah. there, there hasn't been a contract awarded for a lunar lander yet, you know. Yeah. So and and that 2024 date looks pretty doubtful to me. I think it's more likely Elon Musk will land on the moon before NASA. That's what you're going for, is it? Elon I, well, Musk I think that there. Starship program is moving at light speed. Yeah. You know, it's they're going to fly it this year, you know, so yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but we, we've seen with uh, Richard Branson that you only yeah. need an upset. Uh, yeah. And especially if, God forbid, somebody dies in there, yeah. that sets things back so oh, much. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and, you know, I think the breakneck speed that SpaceX are doing things can't continue with that pace forever. I don't, I don't think. I'd like to think it would. Yeah, you would. It's, it's yeah. pretty remarkable, really, what they're doing. It's just amazing. So yeah. we'll see. But uh, I don't doubt in the 2020s we'll be on the moon at some point. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Mars is a little more doubtful, but... Yeah, my uh, my co-presenter Paul always says this is the critical year, 2020. Yeah, it's certainly one. Yeah, it's um, a lot going on. The SLS, I mean, big rocket, unbelievably expensive. Not going to build too many of them, but you know, we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> they're talking about launching one a year. I don't yeah. see how you can really sustain a whole space architecture with no. one a launch a year. Not when you've got. <laughs> um, um, new Glens and new yeah. Well, the Starship SpaceX. is reusable. The whole yeah. rocket's reusable. Yeah. <laughs> Which is yeah. A, and for a rocket that big, too, it's amazing. Yeah. So. That's even with the existing architecture. Before you go to, to yeah. Yeah, Starship, you've got the, the Falcons and right. the and the Dragon yeah, 2, which yeah. is, I think all of that is reusable now, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure the crew Dragon now is landing in the ocean, so I'm not sure how reusable, it remains to be seen how mm. reusable that is, but the rocket's reusable, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think we'll we've see. got, over the next five years, for, for those of us that didn't, weren't around for the Apollo right. era, oh, this, is, this is our exciting. Apollo. Yeah. It's exciting, well, we'll be going to the moon with, you know, going to stay this time. So yeah. I don't think 2024 isn't happening, but that's all right. It doesn't matter if it's yeah. a couple of years later, really. 26 so. probably seems a bit more feasible, doesn't it? It does, I think so. So, and uh, and I don't doubt that SpaceX might get there first, but that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
So now I got the opportunity to have a chat with a volunteer at the museum, Mike Lisa. And as luck would have it, Mike was also an engineer at Grumman in the 1960s, putting this very lunar module test article through its testing regime prior to flying. So another opportunity to geek out and chew the fat with one of the unsung heroes of Apollo about his experiences and all the memorabilia on show. I think this is, I've never seen this before where they've got it mocked up to be like the fabrication, the manufacturing place, and it brings it home just how this important it is. Everybody knows about the astronauts, some people have heard of, you know, yes, um, yes, yes. Um, James Webb and, and people higher up in NASA, but nobody knows about the heroes that are behind it that actually had to make this, design it, build it, all this kind of stuff, exactly. and this really brings it home. And it inspires kids as well. Why wouldn't you want to be that guy or that girl that's building exactly. this stuff? Exactly. This is very exciting. I mean. I worked on the uh, I worked on the program from 1963 through 72, mm -hmm. and uh, I went from being a, uh, a junior engineer to an electronic engineer, and then environmental tests. That's really you know. So I ended up getting into environmental test work, and uh, is that on the environmental systems or environmental tests of the whole system? Of the whole system, yeah, the entire module itself, mm -hmm. and I did some crazy. Crazy, crazy things on it, which were, I, uh, which are amazing, by the way, uh, which I'll tell you about later. <laughs> but nevertheless, this particular unit, I'm, sh I'm sure Josh went through this. Out. This is the LEM test article, and there were a, a few of these built. There may have been anywhere between three and seven of these things built, and they were used for uh, environmental purposes. Uh, we, we would beat it up, shake it, vibrate it, yeah. shock it. This particular one, LTA one, I actually worked on this when I was in Grumman, this particular one. When I look at it, I have to laugh because these strain gauges over here, I actually put them on. And you know how many years ago that is? 50 years ago. And the soldering's still working. Soldering is still Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were all over this thing. But uh, the amount of work that we did on this, uh, whether it be vibration or singing it inside a uh, thermal vacuum chamber, it was amazing. Was that out here at uh, Grumman facilities out in Long Island? Oh, uh, Grumman, yeah, it's over in Beth Page, which is about seven miles from here. Uh -huh. And the worst part of it was it was only a uh, block and a half from my house. So you had to walk it? <laughs> no, to the place. <laughs> it, it, it actually was so close to my house that after a hard day's worth of work, you almost didn't want to go home that quick, you know? So I used to ride off in a different direction and come back around. I had a motorcycle at the time. Uh huh. But, uh, it was very. It, it was a. It was. A, it was actually a privilege to work on this thing. Yeah. Um, so a lot of hours. Yes. Go ahead. Given that you've you've got this national program, such high prestige, the whole world's watching. It's limited time frame to develop something of this capability that no one's ever built before. What was the atmosphere and the feeling like amongst all the engineers that were working on this? Wow. Did you think it was possible? Was it high pressure? Was it just? part of pride that you were involved in it. The feeling was amazing. It was absolutely amazing when uh, when you would walk through the halls inside Grumman. First of all, it was a family. It was one big family. We had like 7,000 people working on this thing. 7,000? 7, 7,000 were working on the program out of the 40,000 people that were in Grumman at the time. Mm -hmm. I said 40,000, it's like 37, whatever it is, but it's a big number. But uh, spread across the country, but the particular program itself, we had about seven guys, seven thousand guys working on it, seven guy, seven thousand people working on it, and uh, we all felt the same way. This is going to work. There was no toys about it. This is going to get our astronauts. The first three, at least, that's what we'll be focusing on. Mm -hmm. You know, which is going to be Apollo 12. It, had to, it was going to be Apollo 12, wasn't it? It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's going and it's coming back and they're coming back in good shape yes but it was uh so exciting day after day you would, it was like you want to go to work i couldn't wait to get in there and do the next step and whatever and uh i had a team of folks working for me at the time and uh when it came time in the morning to give out the orders as to what had to be done boy they just snapped to it they got out there they did the job and everything was done well i mean mm. they, there was no goofing off. There were no people going out for lunches and staying for two hours or something like that. They went out for their 20 minutes or whatever the heck it was and they were back into it. It was great. Just super professional. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. A lot of work, a lot of hours. 
it was 12 hours a day, seven days a week. But happy to be doing that because well, you're working towards you, the shared goal. Yes, we had some, you know, we felt kind of, kind of crazy around the uh, the holiday period of time, you know, because you mm. you weren't really home, you know. Although I only lived a block and a half away, like I tell you, but I missed out a couple of holidays. Yeah, um, yeah, kind of, you know, but it was fantastic. Yeah, and, and given that the lunar module was the first of its kind, the first spacecraft to land on another body with humans inside it that it's it can only be tested i mean you, you can do your vacuum testing but you can only see whether it actually works once it's out there in space and it's a one shot only it has to work first time what are the kind of design considerations that go into something that has so many constraints on its design you know something i think it's an interesting point i mean this is engineering yeah this is what it was all about yeah i mean the amount of testing and the amount of analysis that went on prior to that flight, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you right now, I mean, I could pick out almost any place here, right? parts that we vibrated or tested or shock tested or whatever else. I mean, there wouldn't be anything about this strut over here being tested for a hundred times, a thousand times. We just keep testing it to make sure it didn't break and whatever else. So we were sure when this thing left, and would it be the actual one that was going to be deployed that would be shook and the, played with, or would it be something that is designed and built the same way as one that was tested? This, this particular, this particular one, we actually beat up. When it came to the actual flight replica, we have already taken all the bugs out of it, and we we, we would test it. Don't don't think we, it wasn't tested. Yeah, it would just be tested at a lower level. Yeah, some because you don't want to cause any damage to it. Because you really don't it. want to blow yeah. it up. You know, yeah. you really want to yeah. maintain its integrity. Yeah, and uh, which it, it, it excuse me, it, yeah. it, which it worked perfectly. It was it was actually uh, incredible. And of course, you kind of see that with I think it was when one of the fuel cells was being taken out of the yes. Apollo Apollo one of the earlier Apollo ones that went into Apollo thirteen. That that's what caused the Apollo 13 disaster, wasn't it? That just was just actually taking something out. That was a problem. Yeah. You see, now it's, it's such a shame that that happened because when they took the uh, when they took that particular cell, it was a heater ribbon. It was a heater that was built inside the uh, oxygen tank, one of the oxygen tanks, and it had Teflon covered wire in it. And apparently, in previous tests prior to 13. Uh, it damaged the wire. Mm. But apparently, they didn't pick it up. Yeah. They did not pick this up. And I could sort of understand it in my head right now. Mm. You know, if we were around to go see the cylinder, it's an enclosed cylinder. It's already hermetic. It's, it's Why sealed. would you it's think sealed. that, yeah. Oh, I'm going to open this it's up, but then it's garbage. Yeah. You know, it's garbage. Yeah. But uh, when they took that particular unit and brought it over to 13, and they stirred mm. the oxygen, and they fired that heater, it blew it up. Yeah. But that's where it really shows well, just that's how good this machine is. The machine that you built. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. I know, of course, in, most people know Apollo 13 from the film, which um, probably yes. took quite a bit of license, with the, particularly with, the, um, with how much we knew could be done. I guess you guys knew exactly how far you could push things, what different systems could do. Yes, I, I mean, I, I certainly was not hands-on with all of those uh, particular areas but when it came time for the structural sides of it I knew how much it would probably be able to take yeah. you know and uh, I tell you I had no I had not a problem in my mind saying all the folks the three guys the, the three astronauts were inside the limb and they were using that as a uh, as, as a ferry to come back home no problem you, so at the no, moment no. that that blew and you knew no. that the lem was safe, you knew that I that would get them around the moon and back home. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I knew it was going to do it. it was That's the same attitude it. as when you're designing it and building it before it flies exactly. out. You know it's going to work. Well, it's like you had mentioned before, you know, how did you know you hit all the right buttons in so far as testing was concerned to say that uh, you, you replicated uh, the landings and the takeoffs and everything else and all of the other... Uh, 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 strains and forces, you know, that, did we calculate everything? Yeah. Did we catch everything? Some of these scientists we had, they were just like incredible. Yeah. They just were incredible. Mm. And that's why everything has to be underpinned by science and engineering because yeah. you've already kind of tested it out exactly. theoretically before you built mm. it. It's an amazing program. Yeah. It's an amazing program. I love it. 
I still love. And after all the years, and uh, then I came, after I retired, I, I ended up coming over here as a volunteer, and then they ended up bringing me into staff. And uh, when I walk in here and there's nobody around, it's empty. I look at this thing and I could almost hear all the voices of all the people that were around us. Really? Especially when you go in the other room and you see the complete uh, unit. It's, yes. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, from 50 amazing. years ago. Brings it all back. And of course, you know, discussing it now during the 50th anniversary. Yeah. Uh, it's, I'm reliving it. You yeah. Know? I'm reliving it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, we, we were looking at the um, uh, the yes. lunar module that was going to fly as Apollo 18. Yes. Or was that 19? It was going to fly as. But, um, but that one, of course, was going to be uh, there's going to be more science advancements as each of the missions progress exactly. from Apollo 11 exactly. onwards. Do you know what kind of science was going to be carried out, or what kind of payloads was or were going to go into that lunar mm, module? Not in total. I mean, I know that they threw the rovers in there. You know the. Uh, the motorized uh, vehicles that they were going to use to, yeah. uh, not that much soil sampling devices and soil yeah. robotics. Uh, I mean, that's about it. it really, I, I, I don't know that much about that. Yeah. I do know that the amount of uh, uh, testing they did even with all three, with the, the first three, you know, with Armstrong and, uh, and, and, and Buzz. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, Buzz. Great guy, and uh, they, uh, they had a lot, those guys had a lot. I'm just thinking, I'm getting lost with it because it's like, <laughs> but they've been here. Well, not certainly not Armstrong, but uh, Buzz is always here. He's a card, he's a card, he's, <laughs> but he is one smart guy. Yeah. He's brilliant. Dr. Doctor Orbit, did they call him? Because of his uh, oh, PhD in orbital God. mechanics. Yes, he's yeah. a, and if you go further, and you take it down to uh, 17, the last flight, mm -hmm. Harrison Smith. Whoa, you want to talk to somebody that's brilliant? Yeah. And he was a geologist. Yeah. And the guy was just fantastic. He's yeah. fantastic. They all are. They all, yeah. we, we've met them all. And um, I've, I've seen some of the other designs that Josh showed me over sure. earlier where there were concepts that Grumman were working on for kind of lunar module 2.0s or lunar module pluses. What what were the kind of designs that they were thinking of? Because presumably the expectation from Grumman was that this was gonna the ones go on and designed. on. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah. let's take a wander over and take a look at them. I mean one of them's even like a lunar module or in a sense stage on wheels. Where are we? Uh, is it over here? I might. I think there's a there's a bigger display of them somewhere, but yeah, these are kind of the things, aren't they? Oh, the I know the one you saw about on the other. Oh, it's on the other hallway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's like a whole rack of about twelve yes. different yes. designs inside, inside the glass case. Yes. Yeah. So presumably Grumman thought that this was going to be something that would just get bigger and better and it's continue. It's evolve into whatever. You know, but some of that stuff was uh, actually built in such a manner it wouldn't even work out. They were, they were either too small of a doorway or the ladders were wrong or whatever. But no, it went all through these various different stages. Yeah, you know, that's how, could you imagine that it just would have never worked? That was a concept. <laughs> that's like an H.G. Wells vision oh, for War geez. of the Worlds. It isn't was, it, it was. Yeah. And this. What, what was what was the, the, the concept behind this? It's like, it's crazy. Or cargo I don't know, transport. I don't know. Yeah, but this was just cargo. Uh, this this was what we actually ended up with. Yeah. This is the one when we looked in the, uh, inside okay. the LTA. Yeah. It had the it had the oval uh, uh, entranceway, the doorway. Uh, then and it also had four four legs. This particular one here still had four legs, and it has the square odd doorway. That's the one that's on wheels there, where the, the ascent stage. Yeah. Look at that. Isn't that incredible that, you know... That would have just never worked. <laughs> I don't think this would have never worked. Yeah, this is more than... Uh, so were there some realistic plans during... Well, while, while this lunar module was working, were there any plans that Grumman were putting forward for what would be the next version for I either lunar exploration or even Mars? The only thing I saw beyond this was uh, MOLAB, which is that big monster you saw in the cafeteria. The MOLAB. Oh no, I've not been into the cafeteria yet. What's the MOLAB? Oh, it was a it was a, a mobile laboratory that was supposed to land on the moon. Uh-huh. It was huge. 
I can show it to you if you want to see it. Yeah, that'd be you great. Take, yeah. take a look at that. It was basically a seat carry and carried a bunch of guys, like maybe four or five guys. And uh, it would have uh, had one section which was the laboratory, and the back section was nothing but batteries and all the life support systems mm. in the back of it. It never made it, they never did it. Because of course they're going to have to have something like that for Autumnists, aren't they? they they're going to have extended presence on the moon. There will have to be a way oh of. God, yeah. You must be so excited by that. I hope I'm. I hope I'm still around. Well, it won't be long now, will it? I mean, they're talking 2024. I'm 77. Yeah, but you you look about 50. Yeah, what well, they would do with somebody, the big guy, then take a look up at that array. Oh, look at that. Yeah, that's more lab. That's a Grumman design, is it? Uh, no. The wheels. Are the wheels are a Grumman design. So that's shock, shock absorbing wheels, isn't it? That's, yeah, they actually. So it's like spirals that contract yes. and expand. Yeah. The amount of testing that we did on those wheels, it, it, beyond belief. We did it out in uh, Cavalton, out in Riverhead, east of here. Yeah. About 40 miles east of here. Yeah. Where the fork is. Yeah. And uh, we had a. Uh, in fact, Walter Cronkite was driving one of the vehicles. The newsreader wanted yes. Walter Cronkite. Yes. 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 Yeah. Those things are amazing. Yeah, I mean, um, this doesn't translate very well onto, uh, into audio, but what we're looking at is it basically looks like a stripped-out Gemini capsule with a spiral good. wheel on it, and then it's pulling like a trailer exactly. with, with the same kind of exactly. spiral wheel. So it's, it's got, good, the, good, it's got good, this... Good description. <laughs> Absolutely. That does look like a Gemini capsule, no, it doesn't does. it? it's like an enclosed Gemini yeah. capsule. Yeah. yeah, and that's for transporting people and samples mm -hmm. and... That's tools, what it was I going guess. to be. It yeah. was going to be for... Uh, I'm going to take a picture of that. Yeah, grab it. This is a, it's a shame that we have it out here, too. Because we don't have any room for it in the other area. Yeah. It's just about there, you know. Yeah, the cafeteria is going to get smaller and smaller as you get more and more exhibits. Good. Keep it going. Yeah. We want to get a bigger... We want a larger museum. We'd have a 250-mile range on this thing. Could you imagine that? It was all battery powered. It was incredible. That's crazy because everything was about redundancy wasn't it so yes. if you had an accident Quite, you had to know how far you you could get back if you got in every, trouble so how everything, you do that like, everything everything in the system was quad redundant quad redundant quad redundant but this particular animal had all the power it ever needed in this section so the That's trailer was for the power this is and all the power back here and over here i can't remember how many people i'm thinking three yeah so that's kind of like a service module for a command module. It is. Module, it, is. it actually is. A, it actually is a service module, command module. Yeah. You, you know, when you really get back to it. On wheels yeah. for on the moon or but anywhere. It, but it never went, you know. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe anything like that will end up on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I want to say. Yeah. That's that's, that's going to be. That's not going to be till the thirty. Twenty twenty four. I think it 2020, is. The 2024 think, moon, yeah. 2030s oh, for Mars. Oh, 24s. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, 2030s you're right, you're for right, Mars. Right, yeah. 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 Uh, oh, Mars is a difficult one. I tell you, the, first, the day that, oh my goodness, uh, that particular Elta Lem test article one, uh, no pods, not, they, they, they were no wings, you know, they yeah. had no legs. And uh, I remember when we finally got to the point when uh, we have to shake, vibrate, and shock. A full limb. We have to have it fully dressed. Yeah. And that meant it's a throwaway, obviously. Yeah. You know, one of the seven, or whatever it was. I think there were seven of these LTAs. And uh, we had to build, we had to build a vibration isolation system in the building. And uh, if you want to hear this, it's. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so in this particular place, which now happens to be Grumman, uh, Grumman Studios, wh which is where the Grumman property, uh, where, they, where we actually built these things, which was a, a block out of hands from my house, mm. like I mentioned to you. Uh, they actually dug out inside the, uh, inside the hangar where we did the work. Uh, it wasn't the clean room at this point. This is a vibration area, it's a laboratory, a big laboratory. And uh, I would say that the, uh, the hole was up Arguments at 35 by 35 square, and as far as depth goes, it was a good 12 foot deep. And we were saying, What the heck are you guys? What, what is this all about? You know, of course, the, everything, all it was, everything was secret, you couldn't even ask a question, you know. And we had clearance, but it's none of your business, mm. it's not part of your job, you're not going to know about it. 
And next thing we see them doing, they got this, they've got this thing all smooth off, all, it's all dirt, rock, and next thing you know, they're putting plastic down on it. The bottom line is they filled that thing up with cement, and they had springs every, I would say maybe every three feet, big springs, like about that, like that. And I was like, God knows what this is all going to be about. And they filled it up with concrete, and we waited, I don't know how long for it to cure. And uh, the bottom line is that when it was all finished and cured, we had this one engineer, I keep this guy's name totally escapes you every time I think about it, it says, what's with a B? Anyway, he gets on top of his block and he starts turning the thing, you know, it's like he's got valves, like he's going on every one of the springs. I said, what the hell is this guy gonna do? What's gonna happen here? And he finishes, maybe there were 16 or, eight, or 16 or 18 of these springs. He says, okay, here goes. And he's in the middle. Turns that last one. The block rises up off of the ground, about that far off of the, the main floor. Oh, holy moly, this is a, it's a vibration isolation system. Then we put our shaker tables on each one up there. And then there was a special crane with a micrometer lift on it. Uh -huh. And we dropped the lamb on top of the four shakers on each of the legs and we're able to vibrate that uh, system so you could either vibrate it in sinusoidal so that it was left to right or we could do it all in sync or four legs yeah or we could chuck it you know and bounce it and presumably a lot of this equipment had to oh be developed as well God. for we, this the uh, all the equipment was built with the uh, vibration systems of uh, 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 units were built by ling temco void so we bought those. They, they were huge. They were big. Mm. They're actually speakers, almost, when you get back to it. It's like a speaker turning... You know when you listen to a... a the cone the, on the speaker and vibrates. And it vibra yeah. vibrates, it just pushes all that air. So I figured that thing would all, obviously, steel, the huge magnetic. It was amazing. You mm. couldn't even... If you had a watch on, you could actually walk by. You could actually feel the watch coming. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. But anyway, God knows what it did to you. you know. Yeah. No, I got three children after that, so I was. In. It didn't do that. Didn't bad. cause concussion no, either. No, it didn't do that. No, no, no. Play your teeth out. But anyway, uh, we'd vibrate that thing, and uh, it was totally instrumentated. So we knew vibration, we knew all the accelerations, all the shot, yeah. strain gauges, we knew if anything was stretching, contracting, yeah. the whole thing. And that's the kind of testing we did. Yeah. And it went on for days and days and days. Mm. And, uh, were, you, were you doing drop tests as well to oh see kind of what kind of angles it could possibly land we, at and things like oh that? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're into it, you're good. Oh yeah. Yes, we did. We did the drop tests. We did very short, there were short drop tests. It wasn't like when we drop an aircraft. I mean, we were dropping aircraft like 20 feet in the air and dropping them on the ground, full aircraft. Well, you know, part of aircraft them. test, you, that's, I mean, that's the kind of drop, actually, yeah. They were tested, you know, they were, they were test over stress, yeah. is what we called it. And uh, that was one of the layups that I ran, by the way. And, uh, but we, when we did the shock taps, we would do synchronized shock. So drop all four at exactly the same time, yeah. you know, totally balanced. And then we do offset all the different angles. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thank goodness that, the, you know, when, when Neil went to land that limb, he knew he was in trouble. If he would have landed it where he first attempted at Tranquility. Mm, the boulder he, field. The, yes, the first part of the boulder field. He probably would have landed it on an angle. And we were okay because we knew that the legs, the, 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 uh, the legs themselves were crushable. They were made out of a, uh, a crushable <coughs> aluminum. Yeah. Each one of those legs. So you. That's know, the honeycomb thing the honeycomb, that, that's over exactly, there. Yeah. Beautiful exactly. Beautiful system. So. Absolutely incredible. That's yeah. So analog. <laughs> it, it, it worked beautiful. Yeah. It was absolutely incredible yeah. the way that worked. But uh, when he took it and sailed out another four miles, he put it down too easy. He put it down too easy because he used almost all the fuel in the machine in the in the unit to, uh, for the trip and to drop it down. Because that's the way he does. Yeah, you know, it's coming down the way I want it to come down. Never mind what they're saying. That's what's going to happen if you employ good pilots, isn't it? They're going to they're going to fly things too. That's well. it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I think he was left with a few seconds worth of fuel at the end yeah. of that. And, uh, but you wanted him to land a bit more heavily so that it will compact the legs more. Exactly. Because I mean, we gave him 
we gave them 18 inches or so on the uh, uh, on the crushable, on the uh, uh, on the aluminum, and uh, because he landed so lightly, and you know this, the ladder was 18 inches or 16 inches off of the floor, so when he came down, he had to do that that yeah. crazy bounce and put his foot on the uh, yeah uh, one of the pads, which was which was good too. Yeah, you know. And Pete Conrad, being a short guy, needed to compact it even more. Could you believe it? <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, it, it, it was a. Tr- I, I was. I, I, I was a. Kind of hinting towards this at the beginning. Uh, I was. A, I had just started. I was over there at Grumman maybe not a month or so, or something like that, maybe a month. And at that particular time, I was in the test group. And uh, we were working on an LTA. It was one of the LTAs, not that one. One of the other ones with the legs and whatever on it. And what that happened was uh, we were checking the telescope. There's a telescope up in the front they use for navigation purposes mm-hmm. when they dock. And uh, we were doing work on the limb to make sure that this particular telescope wasn't going to get wrecked while they were, they were doing whatever they were doing, whether it be slamming doors or cabinets on the outside, storage compartments, whatever. And uh, we're waiting. When are we going to get started, guys? I've got how many guys over here, you know, on equipment? When are we get going? Whole thing's instrumentated. We have all the accelerometers on, the strain gauges. You name it. Everything that we could possibly throw over the, all over the web. Mike, they're not coming. He's not coming. He's not coming. But you're five foot seven, so... What would you think about running up the ladder, getting to the top porch, Slamming the door, going inside, grabbing the telescope, and I'm listening to this. I'm only there a couple of months. Here I am as an engineer, an electrical engineer. You were already at the top of the ladder before he'd finished asking no you way. if you wanted to. No. No. <laughs> no. 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 It doesn't work that way. <laughs> How'd you feel about doing it? You know, I said, well, Jesus, that's the sign. Yeah. 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 So he says, listen, all you got to do is put this suit on. Was not an, uh, it, it was more like a. Uh, a ready suit, you know, just a tight, smocky type thing. Yeah. And uh, he says, what do I have to do? He says, oh, you know there's 13 steps. Yeah, okay. Go up to 13 steps, get to the platform, pop open the hatch, and this is the way you have to get into the hatch. Hold it over here, do this slide through, go on the other side, slam it, grab the telescope, do a couple of wiggles, and do the whole thing in reverse. Come on, my time. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Thing. So I got my foot just about ready to go up, and he says, wait a second. And they come behind me with this crazy thing. I said, what the, what the heck is this? He says, the Peter Pan outfit. I said, what is this thing? He says, it's just going to take some weight off of you because we have to simulate. You know, we, we, we don't want your 100 and whatever pounds at the time on those, the rungs, because actually those rungs would be support. Oh, they're too delicate for that. They would not. Those those rungs actually would not support 200 pounds on the ground. I wasn't 200 pounds. But nevertheless, <laughs> it won't. They, yeah. they, they weren't made to do that. Everything was made light. Yeah. The whole you want it as light as weight. possible. Yeah, and exactly. when it's used, you're not going to have heavy guys there because they're going to weigh a six. Exactly. Yeah. So, they had to stick this thing on me. And I went to take a step. Well, I've got to tell you, you wouldn't believe how high up in the air I went. I said, are you guys crazy? I said, I'm not doing this, you know? No, 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 wait a minute, Mike. we got to adjust and we got to put the weights on. And, and <laughs> they got to a point where it was kind of, it was kind of cool. It was yeah. kind of neat. And I went up the steps in some crazy fashion. And I got up there and I had to drag this cable in. It was a little knot trying to bottom of the door. I had to slam it over that, got up there, did my shake. Yeah. Came back down, finished the whole thing, and I was shaking. I was in, <laughs> but it was the most interesting thing in the world because how many people had an opportunity yeah. to walk up that ladder, slam that door, and look out those windows? I mean, we, we did Before it. the astronauts as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, we, and we did it every day because we were always inside and doing yeah. something. In fact, there was always something going on, like people with a, with, with a, with a little sharp putting their name on the inside of the skins, uh, you know, we all have our names. So that name's going to the moon, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where did you put yours? It's on, it's on it. Yeah. We all had it. Right? <laughs> Mine was on the right-hand side. It was on Aldrin's side. It was on the right-hand side, looking out. <laughs> and I guess we all were in the same spot. <laughs> 
just make sure there weren't any nuts or loose nuts or bolts that were floating around. Oh, there were. <laughs> oh, were there? Yeah, we had a. Uh, there was a point in time where we, uh, the uh, uh, NASA QA guys, the quality assurance guys, were always around, and when we knew they were coming in our area, oh my God, we just uh, Jesus, mm. there's nothing going wrong. Going, right? over, going over everything with a magnet, trying to get all the no, debris we out. No, we had a thing called. We had a, a machine called the tumbler. And uh, what they would do is it actually would, it was uh, attached to the side of the ascent, uh, the ascent stage. And uh, it would take the, it would take the unit and, and rotate it and flip it. It would just like a gimbal, it was just rotate. And they decide they're gonna do the test. They put the thing, they connect it, and clink, clink, out comes a nut. Clink, clink, so whatever was in there was loose. They shut us down for a whole week. They inspected the living daylights out of every one of those lamps. And we were running maybe, I, w I would say, uh, I guess I saw as many as four lamps at the same time inside uh, the clean room. And this is where this whole thing was taking place. Not the tunnel. The outer cane, and it that was the other thing. It, it was wiped clean. They made sure that thing was pristine. When they got finished with it, but uh, there were that many units. There was at least maybe eight, ten guys on each one of them. And then we sat like this for one week until they checked. A week you could have done without losing as well, because you got yeah. tight enough pressures as it is. And we just kept under that pressure for twelve hours. Yeah. You know, are they going to call us in? Is the time? You know. Yeah. But that's what they had to do to make it right. Yeah, because you don't want another so Apollo terrible. 1. You don't want another... Jeez. Well, you don't, didn't want Apollo 13 happening. But, yeah. Yeah. No, Apollo 1, really. Yeah. That, day was, that was a terrible day. Yeah. But 13 was... That was, that was disgusting. Mm. I saw the pictures of... Uh, I saw the inside of the, uh, the craft when it was... Uh, not physically, I didn't, well, you know, picture-wise, I saw it. Mm. it was, uh, scratch marks. From the guys trying to get out. Inside Apollo 1. Yeah. It was disgusting. It was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. And you're always going to take stock at times like that to think, yeah. is it actually worth it? You know, something, things like that make you work harder. Make sure you, you know, it, it made us more diligent to the yeah. hey guys, you know. Make sure you do the job correctly. Yeah. If anybody ever, if anyone even thought that you were doing the job incorrectly, they will let go. Or they will send you right back for certification. I mean, for the people that used to do the soldering and all, they used to go through the certification. You say, hey, well, what is it to solder? You know, yeah, yeah. Mm. They put them out there for hours mm. learning how to solder. Yeah. How to carry your, how to carry your your, your tools and. What mm. But it'll, I guess it? Apollo One, even though it's not really a, a, an issue of testing like we were mentioning with Apollo 13 when you're taking bits out and put them in somewhere else you can induce errors wasn't it the fact that they were stepping on the wires that had cut through that that had worn the way through the insulation yes so you know even by being in there and using it for more than it's intended to can induce these kind of things so the more you're testing the more safe you are the more you verify things can ironically create more chance yes, of absolutely. issues absolutely yeah. absolutely i mean some of those tests we used to call them, I'm trying to remember, now, they were destructible and non-destructibles, and uh, we, would get, we would get a piece and would say, non-destructible. A piece of tubing, that long, non-destructible, which meant that piece is going, it's going on the unit, it's going on the spacecraft. So we had to do testing, a lighter level of testing, different, there was a, there was a sinusoidal testing, which was nothing more than what you would expect, the sinusoidal, you know, just like hearing a tone. And then we had a thing called random testing, because the random testing was just white noise being generated to those uh, speakers, and that actually represented the takeoff, you know, the five engines. The vibration of the, the takeoff, yeah. Exactly. And that certainly was destructive, you know, and, and to see, it, it was destructive in general to the entire uh, Saturn V. Uh, uh, not that it damaged it mm. in too many ways. But you have to know that, don't you? But you have to find it out. Mm. You have to find that out. And you're not going to get a Saturn V to play with. 
So, you, <laughs> so you've got all these simulation devices and all of these analyticals that you have. Uh, well, yeah, there's a weight. Uh, you know, you've got weight over here. You've got uh, tangent uh, alignments over here. That you have to worry about and forces. Da, 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 da. The guys figured this stuff out. They were fantastic. You know. Yeah. They were. They, they, it was great. Yeah. You learned a lot. It was interesting. Well, Mike, Lisa, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Right. See you. Just like the amateur scientists in the Age of Enlightenment, it took a field of scientific study to be invented before it could mature and show utility. It took Francis Bacon, Isaac Newton, Copernicus and others to formalise the concept of the scientific method before amateur and hobbyist scientists like Cavendish, Franklin and Lavoisier could observe the laws that govern our universe. So it was in the Age of Flight where it took amateur scientists Da Vinci, Bernoulli and George Cayley to understand the principles of aerodynamics before the hobbying Montgolfier and Wright brothers could develop machines that would take advantage of the theory. This leads inexorably to greater and greater development where there's a profit motive, intense human curiosity or a hot or cold war to supercharge momentum. Once the skills and infrastructure exist, we can turn it to anything. Human curiosity can never be exhausted. It's hard baked into us, an argument can be made to say it's what defines us, makes us human. The only restriction on how fast we can realise the ultimate extent of Bernoulli and Orville Wright's hobbyist groundwork is money, or a shortage of money. If humanity lasts long enough, we will colonise the solar system and explore the stars. It's an inevitable, no unavoidable consequence of the human condition. The question is, do we want to make steady progress and leave the excitement to future generations, or do we want to go as fast as we can in this pursuit to see, learn, and understand as much as possible in our own lifetime? And I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Fran, Josh, Mike, and all the other wonderful people at the Cradle of Aviation Museum for being so welcoming. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod.com or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.